But as far as I have told you, I'm a, basically in science journalism. I usually cover hard science like genetics and these kind of things. Uh, but there is relevant overlap, I think, with the kind of research you do. Uh, and the structure of the day will be the following. First of all, I will give you a talk about, to try to give you some context of uh, how um, science in newspapers really work, what is the uh, real cynical situation and not the blue sky uh, portrait of what's going on. Then, in the, after the coffee break, I will try to focus on some specific advice on how to write effective text. Uh, and, uh, and then we will go to the exercise, which will be the larger part, the larger part of the day. So the exercise will be the first basic layer of thing that is interesting and is important to learn to do if you want to write about these kind of issues, that is trying to uh, extract from a paper. Uh, I think you have seen two papers, one on the Naples Waste Crisis and one on Costa Montana. Uh, try to extract from these papers a press release. So a press release would be addressed to journalists, basically to convince them to write correctly about your research, but the, the, the criteria that we will, I will try to convey and that we will try to work on are useful to write whatever kind of news and they are the basis of also for writing, for example, a longer feature. So first of all, before lunch, we do this writing exercise, divided in groups. Uh, I am the responsible of the fact that we will have lunch at the Spanish time at two. I'm sorry for that, <laughs> but uh, it was more practical like this. So take advantage of the coffee break. And then after lunch, we will um, basically put the exercise here, your work here on the wall, and, and discuss it together to try to figure out what are the best strategies. Okay, so first of all, let me start with an example taken from, taken from my specific uh, journalistic background, so basic science. This is an article taken from El País, the main newspaper in Spain. Um, it's in Spanish, but I will translate the main parts. So the title is uh, a, precision, uh, uh, a Bullet Against Cancer, and uh, it describes a molecule uh, that has been presented in a conference. The molecule is called Trastuzumab. Uh, it's a molecule against pain, <coughs> a new uh, uh, chemical against pain. And in the middle of the article, at a certain point, when Trastuzumab is presented for the first time by the journalist, there is a parenthesis. And he says, this molecule is what the mm, pharmaceutical company Roche calls Herceptin. And he adds this sentence. Roche is the laboratory that has invited El País to go to the conference. What is he saying? He's informing the reader that he has been paid, that the journalist has been paid to attend the conference. Okay? So this is kind of historical in the Spanish press. The article, I think it was in 2000, uh, no, sorry, it was in 2012, and I think it is the first instance in the Spanish press in which a journalist acknowledged that he has gone to a conference being paid by the company. So why this miracle? Why has this happened? Mm, because uh, a couple of years before, three years before, in 2009, there was another article on uh, mm, chemicals to cure uh, pain. Uh, the title of the article was Pain as the Fifth Vital Sign. It was written by a freelance. And in this article, there was an, enth an enth enthusiastic description of another molecule uh, mm, specifically, uh, one called okay, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, another another medicine, and um, uh, this medicine was uh, uh, described as a kind of um, wonder drug against pain, and uh, it was uh, pro presented in a conference called the European Pain uh, Congress in uh, Lisboa, mm. and uh, after this article was published. Uh, there was an avalanche of uh, letters to El País written by uh, doctors specifically because they say how can, can you present this as a wonder drug if trials have not been done, if there, are a lot, there is a big discussion whether this is effective or not, or not. And the story ended with an article by Leros Perez Oliva, which is a very important science journalist in Spain, and at that time was the person in charge basically of answering to complaints by readers. 
And she acknowledged that there was a big problem in this article. And the problem was that Micah Sanchez, the freelancer, had been invited by the company, Grunenthal in that case, to attend the conference. Uh, and she said, I will translate you, um, uh, well, she describes the, the fact that the, the article has been wrongly biased in favor of the, of the chemical. And she says that the uh, Libro de Estilo, which means basically the, the book that collects the rules uh, to which El País journalists have to uh, obey, let's say, establishes that the newspaper in general does not accept invitation to elaborate information. An exception has to be specifically uh, um, allowed by the direction. And when this happens, uh, the information that the journalist has been invited to the conference mm -hmm. must be given to the reader, okay? So, likely, what we saw at the beginning, 2012, was the cons consequence of this story here. One thing I can say is that Micah Sanchez, this freelancer, got paid about 80 euros for that article. So, if you pay 80 euros for an article, obviously, you cannot really expect to be top-level quality and that she was allowed by somebody to go to the conference and it, uh, her article was uh, um, read and corrected by an editor. So uh, El País gave all the fault to the freelancer, but there was a big bunch of responsibility uh, in the newspaper. So I'm telling you this uh, uh, bad story, this sad story, because uh, the basic idea of this talk is to convey the fact that there are a lot of pressures when you write about science and environment as well in newspapers. There are a lot of biases and there are a lot of feedback loops that shape the picture of what comes out in the media when you write about these issues. And this is not a problem only of the media. This is a problem that, let's say, fires back to science itself. So, for example, this is a very interesting study that was done in 1991, but I, uh, I'm sure it, works, it would work uh, today. In this study, basically, uh, the um, researchers asked themselves whether the fact that a paper was reported in the New York Times influenced the impact factor of the paper, okay? That is influenced, not, sorry, not the impact factor, influenced the number of citations that the paper received subsequently, okay? And they found that, yes, papers that were reported on the New York Times, in fact, had a plus of citations with respect to papers that were not reported in the New York Times. Now, one could say, okay, this plus of citation is not explained by the fact that the paper has been reported in the New York Times. It may be that simply the New York Times chooses paper that anyway would receive a plus of citation, okay? But they took advantage of a very curious situation, that is the fact that during a certain period, the New York Times uh, made a strike, the workers at the New York Times had a strike, they didn't publish the paper, but they continued to edit an internal newspaper only for the purpose of not interrupting the internal archive, okay? So the criteria for selecting articles were exactly the same, but those articles didn't come up to the public. And what he, uh, they saw is that in this case, this plus of citation disappeared. Mm -hmm. So really, it's a, it's a very striking study that shows you that what comes out in the media really influence a basic mechanism of scientific research, which is how scientists cite each other, okay? So in fact, there are, now there are interesting studies that when they calculate the impact factors of uh, scientific publications, they include also the impact factor of um, outlets like in the New York Times or The Guardian or, or this big thing. Okay, so after this introduction, uh, it uh, uh, starts to become clear that the standard traditional vision of how science, uh, health, environment, technology is communicated in the media, let's say the blue sky vision, is not um, uh, really, uh, not even close to what is really happening. What is this standard vision? It's a vision in which basically science is something that is done in the lab and in the universities, uh, scientists communicate it to journalists, and journalists translate it to the public in a kind of cascade. What 
I start to show you, and I will try to show you later, is that in fact there are plenty of feedback loops, okay? So for example, now we have seen that what comes out in a newspaper can influence how science works, okay? So I feel um, entitled to talk about this issue because personally I have been involved in all the um, chains, the, in all the parts of this chain. So this was a picture of me when I was younger and younger <laughs> without glasses. Uh, so I was a scientist in a lab for a long time. Uh, I am still a freelance journalist. I have been a press officer for a short period of time for in a public in a, in, a, in a research institution here in Barcelona. And obviously, I'm also a reader, a member of the public. Okay, so um, let us focus on the first part of this uh, feedback loop. So how? science influences, uh, puts a kind of pressure on, on, on journalism. The first tool, uh, the first thing item that I want to mention is what I call the propaganda machinery of, uh, of science. Um, in this uh, very interesting article, a very interesting book, uh, there was a curious data about, um, about co the communication world in Spain that is that um, at the beginning of the previous century, uh, almost all institutions like unions and parties had what they call propaganda offices, okay? At the end of the century, they had, uh, all of them had this kind of offices, but they were called communication offices, public relation offices, etc. <laughs> and the only institution that maintained it was TNT, which is an anarchist uh, union in Spain. So, we maintain the name propaganda, I mean, okay? But uh, in this uh, PR communication world, the DNA of propaganda is still there, okay? In fact, in a, a 1998 study, it was found that in the city of London, uh, there were uh, 13 press officer, officers for each journalist. So each journalist had more than a football team <laughs> devoted to convince him or her uh, to publish certain kind of so it's really a propaganda machinery. A key tool of this propaganda machinery are press releases. So this is a um, screen capture of a website um, um, by nature. If you are a journalist, you can uh, subscribe fr um, for free to this website, and you get, you get an ID and a password. And you, when you enter in this, uh, you, okay, this is an old screen capture, it's 19, in 2009, but I entered here yesterday, for example. And you find basically a few days in advance what nature is going to publish. Mm. These are called embargoed press releases, okay? Embargoed, why? Because you get access to these press releases by signing an agreement <coughs> in which you say that we, you will not say anything about the content of the press release, so the content of what Nature will publish next uh, Thursday, um, before the time that is specified here. So you see, embargoed until, so this is the deadline after which you can publish something on this day, okay? Um, so here is a, uh, there is an example of an embargoed press release. There is a short summary made explicitly for journalists. Here you have a set of material, for example, you have a picture, there has been a study that has shown that the order in which nature gives this list is um, related to the frequency of the uh, um, publication of this news in the, in, the, in the media. That is, for example, this news will likely receive more coverage than this, that will likely receive more coverage than this, the order, you know? And then the, whether the news has a picture or not, makes a very big difference, especially on the internet, okay? So it is a really effective mechanism. This is another platform, Eureka Alert, which is the platform of the American Association for the Advancement, Advancement of Science, which is the editor of Science, the other big scientific magazine. And the, the logic is the same. You have a, a password, you access, here you have a list of publications. Now it is much longer, you have a, Plus the proceeding of the National Academy of Science, uh, a set of papers, science itself. You, you click on this and you get a list of embargoed press releases. Okay. 
So, an example of uh, an embargo press release. So, <coughs> this mechanism, uh, which was introduced, I think, in the 90s, roughly, it's quite recent, at the beginning was hailed as a big advance because uh, the fact that you could know in advance what magazines were going to publish was very useful for a, for a newspaper and moreover eliminated leaks and um, privileged information and exclusive <coughs> information. So basically, all newspapers, all outlets have the same access to the information. When it is the time, the right time to publish it, or the time that uh, when it is allowed to publish it, they publish it all together. And this is the reason why usually on Thursday and Friday you get a lot of scientific news in the in the um, newspapers because it's the days in which Science and Nature are published. Okay, but okay, so this is what the original idea, and in fact the press releases mechanism is very very effective. In this study, it was shown. Basically, the study analyzed uh, seven of the main international newspapers. Uh, they analyzed the science news in this internet, science, health, environment, and technology news in these international newspapers, and they checked for a certain period of time, and they checked in the same period of time who, what, which press releases four of the main scientific journals were issuing. And they matched them. They, they looked uh, they they, they um, ask themselves whether the news that were published here were correlated with the press releases that were published by these outlets. Okay, is it clear? <coughs> what they found is that 84% of the news published in these reference ma uh, newspapers were correlated with press releases. It doesn't mean necessarily that the press release triggered the article, but it is likely. Okay, so it is really an effective mechanism. That is, journalists are digging news, are finding news by themselves, only in a minority of cases. The, in the rest of the cases, they rely on this propaganda machinery. Okay, so as I told you at the beginning, it was accepted and hailed as a big advance, but there are some concerns. First of all, here is a study uh, about uh, uh, press releases issued by uh, nine prominent medical journals. In this study, the researchers found, the reference is here, the researcher found that only a minority of these press releases included some key information like study limitations, whether the result is a miracle or whether there are things that are still to be solved or investigated, or whether the uh, research was funded by a company. So, if we are relying in the majority of our articles in newspapers on press releases, and press releases have, have these big biases, maybe we have a problem. Then, the embargo me mechanism itself creates some kind of biases, because in the agreement that you sign when you, when you, when you accept to receive embargo news, you accept that you don't speak with anybody about this news in, uh, uh, in advance, before the dead time. So where is double check? How can you double check your news? How can you ask to an independent expert whether those, that study is so important as it is portrayed in the press release? And then regarding not press releases, but press offices or propaganda offices, this is a terrible disease that affects many journalists. That is the, cap I, I, I have called it the captive journalist syndrome. That is the fact that my best scoops or the, the scoops of journalists that uh, have this disease uh, depend on an exclusive that has been given by a press office. Okay? All the bad news, the best news are not found, found by the journalist himself or herself, but by somebody that has told me, hey guy or hey girl, here is a nice thing. What happens then? then, when you have to cover that institution, maybe in a critical situation, maybe in a situation in which the, the institution has done not such a good job, you are captive, you, are a, you, you have a problem because you put at risk a key source of scoops for yourself. For yourself. So why has the scientific institutions um, created this big propaganda machinery. 
here are some possible reasons. One reason is really honest, the honest will to inform the public about what they do. And I, I must say that this is a very important reason and mm, most institutions make press release and set up press offices because they really want to, to uh, communicate to the public. But there are other reasons that must be taken into account. Obviously the personal ambition of scientists or institutions, um, economic pressures, this is for me one of the leading reasons, that is the fact that especially in post-Cold War science, uh, funding to science has not increased, uh, in, has not the perspective of um, increasing uh, indefinitely, uh, so institutions are competing for funding, both public and private, and, and one of the fields of competition is really um, newspapers and other outlets. And then obviously there is ideology. Um, uh, in the case of the research you do, it is, I think it is quite clear that what communication and how what communicate what information is given and how the information is given has a big impact in, poli in politics but also in very basic science this works things for example about genetics maybe you remember that in the 90s almost everything was genetic mm -hmm. homosexuality dictatorship or uh, whatever was uh, due to a specific gene <coughs> why was this happening <coughs> First of all, because there was a big economic pressure to fund the, um, the Human Genome Project. So even though nowadays the diseases that can really be treated thanks to the Human Genome Project are less than, um, I mean, you, you can count it with the fingers of one hand. So one should discuss whether that investment was really uh, useful at least for um, for fighting diseases maybe it was useful for, for something else but at that time it was very important to convey this idea but there was a very deep a, a deeper reason that has been investigated by a, a researcher here in the autonomous university of barcelona that has scanned newspaper for 30 years uh, for a period of 30 years <coughs> using uh, uh, um, uh, studying how genetics was covered is that this happened exactly in the 80s, 90s, when there was the increase of this kind of neoliberal vision of, uh, of uh, um, economy. So uh, it was very useful to convey the idea that the um, health condition of people, that the features of the life of people was something that was inherited and not something that depended on the environment. So even in this very, at this very basic level, of, of science, um, propaganda can have a big uh, ideological bias. If I'm not clear or if you want to ask something, please interrupt. So we have asked why science sets up this propaganda and we may ask as well why this propaganda is so successful in newspapers. Here are a few answers, or a few possible answers. In a study that was published in 2008, it was found that um, in this period of time, the staff in the main British newspaper remained the same while the space to be filled in uh, traveled. And this is only the space in paper. Imagine that now you have Twitter, you have the online, you have videos, etc. So really, in this situation, you are really thankful when somebody gives you information that is well packaged and, and that you can publish without much investigation. And another reason why propaganda is so successful is that the format, in this case of printed <coughs> newspapers, but one could extend it to other outlets, has been strongly simplified. Imagine, look at these two mm, covers of El País. Here you have a uh, head, uh, a kicker, two subheads, a lead in black, a lead, and, and then the article. On the contrary, here you have a kicker, a title, but one subtitle, and the lead in, uh, in black has disappeared. And uh, here you have uh, other elements that are, have disappeared here. So here you can see a graphical um, portrait of how um, the press has simplified even its forms. <coughs> This is between 80s and uh, 2000? No, 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 this is uh, quite recent. This change, 
Yes, you see uh, Diario Independiente de la Mañana and El, El Periódico Global en Español, which was a change in the subtitle of the name of the El País, which was done, I think, two or three years ago. Okay. Okay, so now that we have explored this link, let's focus on this feedback link. So, a very important um, thing about this feedback loop is what I've told you at the beginning, is that st study that showed that what came out in newspapers could influence citations in, uh, in, uh, in scientific publications. I will give you another example, which is what very striking for me in 2006. I don't know if you remember it. Uh, in 2006, there was a big, big, big uh, news boom around the case of a family of Turkish people that were quadrupedals, that walked on their four. Okay? Uh, and uh, um, this was presented in the media as the missing link between uh, human and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, no, this is true. I mean, this was the standard title in media. What is interesting that this was not only an interpretation of media. If you go in the abstract of the original papers, they are conveying this idea. Here you see, wow. consider... A, in, uh, it's a, the final part of a sentence that you say that says that scientists should consider whether a similar gate may have been used by human ancestors, or this new syndrome may be used as a live model of human evolution. So they were I mean, obviously this was bullshit. I mean, these <laughs> poor guys and girls had a neurological problem, but they were conveying this idea. And there's more. A few days. After the publication of the paper, imagine 6 March 2006, mm, 11 days after, the BBC published a 60 minutes documentary on this paper. Obviously, you don't do a 60 minutes documentary in 10 days. This must have been something that had been set up with the, news, that, with the scientists mm, mm, in advance before the scientific publication. So this is another instance in which you can really see how um, what comes out in the media is uh, entangled with what comes out in scientific publications in a very basic fashion. I mean, in this case, I think it's a bad story of bad practice. I mean, people would not do this. But OK, it's an extreme case to, to, to keep in mind. OK, I will not tell you a lot about how journalism influences the public, because certainly you have seen movies and you have a lot of thought about this, really. Um, obviously, news that the media has a strong uh, power to bias the public. What I think is more interesting <laughs> is this last feedback loop, how the public um, generates pressure on what is published in the newspapers. So one first dimension of uh, this in issue um, when we are talking about science, environment, health and technology journalism is curiosity. Here there is the results of the main study in Spain about um, the impact of, um, of magazines, okay? In the monthly magazines, among the first five, you have three magazines that are explicitly devoted to science, environment, health, and technology. Interessante, Quo, and National Geographic. So this means that there is a big curiosity, a big request of information on these issues uh, from the public. A second dimension is anxiety. OK, let me say something more. I mean, the fact that there is a big curiosity obviously biases, uh, creates a pressure on what gets published, on what gets published. In fact, if you look at these three magazines, I don't know, I mean, maybe Spanish people will know about it. While this magazine is a standard feature-like um, uh, outlet, these two are really heavy popularization. Are really, here you, once I wrote an article for this one which was about uh, researching invisibility, and there was a big two-page two um, picture of an invisible man entering in the toilet of a girl that was having a shower. Okay? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think I've conveyed the idea of how curiosity can sh shape what comes out in the house. Another dimension is anxiety <coughs> that really ends up influencing what comes out in the house. This is another sad story but that happened in 2005. Uh, this guy is a physicist, Antonio Brew, which works in Madrid. 
And in May 2005, he called a press conference. There was this guy here and a woman close to him. And he said, I have cured the cancer of this woman through fractal physics. OK? So this guy was I mean, is a reputed physicist. He has published papers in important jour journals. He was doing research in the relation between cancer and fractals. And when he called this press conference, there was another news boom with articles like this one. A Spanish <coughs> physicist manages to cure a, ca a, a terminal um, liver cancer. This um, uh, page in particular was put in what was on the wall in my office when I was doing my PhD because we were very proud that the physicists had made this. But obviously, shortly after, doctors started to say, hey guys, these 10 girls, this, this person has cured one woman, if he has. So there is a strong, there are strong doubts. I mean, the, the statistics is really poor. And in fact, after less than one year, the tests with this method were stopped because there was no evidence at all that they were effective. But still today, if you type Antonio Bru in Google, you have titles like this one. Antonio Bru, the Spanish hero that stops cancer applying fractal geometry, fights against the dragon, which is pharmaceutical companies. Or this one that is uh, Antonio Bru. It would, Antonio Bru says it would be necessary to, it would be enough to potentiate the immune system to um, overcome cancer. So still today you have in very high position in the ranking of Google this kind of news. So this is a story that tells you how the anxiety of the public with respect of issues like cancer ends up shaping what comes out in the media. And then the third dimension I would like to mention is confidence. In all opinion polls, at least at the Spanish and the European level, you see that scientists and people in the academia are ranked among the more reliable people. Mm, certainly more reliable than journalists, and, more reliable, and very, uh, much more reliable than politicians, for example. But this is a, a double-edged issue, because at the same time, um, when this confidence is betrayed, uh, it is very easy to, um, that the image of scientists in the media change completely. So usually you have that scientists are portrayed in the media either, either uh, as saints or as demons. Okay? Um, a typical case, if, uh, I'm sorry I'm giving a lot of Spanish examples because I've been living here in the last few years, but a typical case is the last page of La Vanguardia, a Spanish newspaper in which there are very popular interviews to interesting people. And if you look at these interviews, you, you will find that usually when a scientist is interviewed, it is portrayed as a kind of uh, uh, miracle guy or miracle girl that will cure cancer or whatever. But at the same time, they interview other people that portray scientists as uh, kind of um, corporate uh, technocrats that don't allow people to seek for their health in a natural way and this kind of thing. So it's a very contradictory way and uh, of, of portraying scientists. And I think this is related to the issue of confidence. That is, maybe we are putting, maybe the public is putting too much confidence in scientists when uh, they shouldn't, which generates a lot of, um, of, uh, uh, negativity when uh, when people find that scientists are not uh, saints as they are often. So finishing this first part, <coughs> I think that I, uh, after this it should be clear somehow that that cascading representation was is completely um, uh, not real. I mean, it's really far away of how things really work in, uh, in the media, and that there are plenty of feedback loops between these actors. The issue <coughs> here is, should we break these feedback loops and try to set up a situation in which scientists are the ones entitled of uh, telling the truth, and journalists are the, one the ones entitled of translating this truth to the public, and that's it. <coughs> From my point of view, this would not be correct at all. It wouldn't be possible at all. 
So the real issue is not breaking these feedback loops, but it's this one. That is, the portrait of science in the media, is it determined by an agenda, set, an agenda setting process set up by this propaganda machinery? Or can the public really use these feedback loops to uh, set up a form of democratic participation and democratic control of science? And so, what about journalists? What, uh, obviously, my opinion is that it would be desirable to have a democratic participation process and not an agenda setting process. So, what journalists can do to trigger <coughs> this democratic participation process? Here is the cover of uh, Nature in 2008 when there was the um, com World Conference of Science Journalists in Nature in, uh, in London. They, it's a very nice drawing. They say the title was Science Journalists cheerleaders or watchdogs? <coughs> Cheerleader and a watchdog. If as a journalist you are cheerleading, you are really um, accepting the agenda setting process of the uh, propaganda machinery of science, I would stress that it is strongly needed that uh, covering science, environment, um, technology, and health in the media needs a lot more of watchdogging, let's say. So, even when covering science, media, and environment, we as journalists should keep in mind this uh, very interesting, very important sentence by George Orwell that a journalist is printing something, <coughs> is printing what someone else does not want printed, everything else is public relation. And how is this translated? First of all, not relying only on uh, press releases, but trying to find original stories, focusing on controversial issue, issues, applying to these kind of things, <coughs> to these issues, the same critical spirits which is applied to other issues like politics and uh, economy or whatever. Go beyond popularization and last minute results and look for science that really matters to the public. And then, uh, uh, something that is usually very useful is not focusing only on scientific results, but on the concept, the context of the, those results, the context of science, the world of science, that is, how funding works, how science policy works, what are the ethical issues, what are the human resources issues, what are the debates within science. In summary, I would advocate for more science in, in journalism, but also for more journalism in science. Um, I have attached a final a part to this presentation, and then I will go to question and answers. Specific, a specific part uh, related to environmental journalism, because I think is, uh, this is of interest for you. Basically, here is a list of uh, issues or of uh, features for environmental journalists that um, I think journalists should take into account when covering uh, environmental issues. First of all, usually in these cases, evidence, documents, information is complicated. It's not just um, scientists have found this gene or uh, scientists have managed to capture this molecule. Documents like the Kyoto Protocol are really, really difficult to, to navigate through for a journalist. So this is the first important thing. Secondly, these are issues in which facts are surrounded by a big halo of uncertainty. So in some times you cannot really measure, there is nothing that cannot really measure to make, um, to, to have a clear idea of what is happening. For the Italians in this room may, may remember a famous case uh, that was very strong in 2013 about um, nuclear waste uh, boats um, that were suspected to be sunk in the seas of Calabria in southern Italy by a uh, criminal organization. There were recordings, telephone recordings, uh, about uh, members of criminal organization talking about uh, uh, sinking this ship, this ship. But obviously it's completely impossible to, or at least it's very, very difficult to find where they are, to measure how um, radioactive they are, so this is a case in which facts are really difficult to establish. 
Then there are cases in which there is a big um, um, range of uncertainty. So, for example, when IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Pan Panel of Climate Change, gives um, forecast of weather or sea level uh, changes, mm. they give a big range of uh, um, uncertainty, which makes very difficult to communicate this issue. In fact, there was a very interesting editorial by Nature a few years ago called The Real Pulse of Climate Change that basically stated that uh, the uncertainties in, in climate change science are present, are there, are very important, even though they are not the ones that usually climate skeptic uh, highlight. So in this case, it's usually for journalists using a precaution, precautionary principle is a good rule of the thumb, <coughs> but it's not a universal solution because there are plenty of examples in which too much precaution has proved to be not wise. So for example, in 1967, there was a massive vaccination in the US uh, because it was expected that a big swine flu epidemic would outbreak that didn't outbreak. Then there is the case of Sakharin, which uh, was accused of being a uh, uh, cause of cancer, and there was a big precautionary attitude in the media and in the public uh, regarding this, and in the end, it was proved that there was no evidence at all of cause of cancer. And then there is the interesting case of irradiated foods. Uh, irradiation of foods is a standard procedure to uh, kill um, microbes. Um, and the outcoming food has, um, in fact, has doesn't have negative impacts on health. It has positive impacts because when you kill microbes, you really you are killing potential uh, infections. Infections, but the fact that food has been irradiated uh, created so, such a big um, unrest in the public that, in fact, nowadays it's a completely um, minority technology. So I must say that the cases in which precaution is too much usually are not many. I mean, there are more examples of cases in which precaution has been too little than cases like these ones. But obviously, you have to take into account. Another case are the, so the mistakes in IPCC reports. Now we see that the first IPCC reports made predictions that uh, are, were not true. But this is the standard dynamics of science. It's the standard dynamics of uncertainty. So in this, how can you deal as a journalist with this uncertain situation? First of all, really try to identify what can indeed be measured or quantified and keep it in mind. And then um, another um, issue that has been, has been taken into account or, or critical issue when precautionary principle is applied uh, in a, um, I mean, automatically is that um, uncertainty can be used, especially by corporation, to um, uh, carry on their specific agenda setting. There is this very inter interesting book called Doubt, Doubt is their product it, it, that uh, documents how, for example, the tobacco, tobacco industry has uh, uh, used a lot the uncertainty or has uh, amplified the uncertainties related to scientific research on the effect of tobacco on health to carry on their agenda, basically to continue to sell. So it's a complicated issue. Good. Then another, other important features of uh, environmental journalists are what I call multiplicity. That is, you have a big range of different issues that fit in environmental journalism. You have many dimensions, so many disciplines, and I think you know well about this, are, um, must be taken into account, and moreover, they have many feedback loops together, and there are multiple stakeholders, not only experts, but also activists, citizens, politicians, trade unions, etc. And all of these stakeholders, each of these stakeholders is expert in its own way. So journalists should take into account this. Two other relevant problems in this uh, in environmental journalists are infoxication and one language. So when we talk about environmental issue, there is one new report every day. There are constant uh, events or calls for the press, 
uh, there are many activist platforms and it is very difficult to find which one is reliable if, and which one is not that reliable. And there are even campaigns that look like informative campaigns but that are in fact PR, com PR campaigns from, from companies. So really, if you want to cover these issues as a journalist, you need to delve, delve into the stories and uh, to, to really have separate the sheep from the goats in this uh, multiple uh, and um, enormous amount of information. And the clear, clear rule of the thumb to understand whether a report, a journalistic report or a journalistic feature on environmental issue, issues is uh, reliable or not, is to check whether the facts are presented as anecdotes, isolated, as something that is self-contained, or whether they are connected to a string of other facts. If this connection with the string of other facts is absent, then you are almost surely you are almost sure that there will be misinterpretation of the facts. So bringing in context is very important. Then there is this practical issue of the word language that is the fact that some, some words like sustainability or valorization have uh, mm, assumed such a broad uh, field of uh, um, meanings that if you want to use them, you really need to make the effort of explain them again because this will force you to open the black box and to uh, tell exactly what you mean by using sustainability, for example, in a specific instance. Uh, since we are late, I will go, I will skip a couple of things. Um, just these two things I think are important. An important thing when you are doing environmental journalism is avoiding this kind of good and bad uh, division because there are many examples in which uh, heroes have become villain and the other way around. So here are biofuel and wind farms. <coughs> biofuel was hailed at the beginning as a natural, clean energy a solution to many problems, but now we have seen that there are, um, there are side effects, like for example the effect that it has on agriculture, and wind farms as well. They were the symbol of uh, uh, clean energy, but now we have seen that they have many complex interactions, for example, with, the, um, with, the, with birds and with the impact they have on the landscape. And then there is this equidistance issue. Uh, Nature published uh, an editorial which was called No Balance Needed uh, regarding, uh, regarding climate change uh, coverage in the media, in which they say that in cases like climate change, it is not wise to apply the standard journalistic rule of the time that is presenting the two point of views or the multiple point of views in the same, uh, with the same space, in the same, uh, with the same amount of, uh, of coverage, because really the positions are not at the same levels. Some uh, of them are really, um, don't have really support by, by the scientists. And then in conclusion, as I told you before, um, <coughs> regarding science in general, the public um, has uh, requires a lot of information on science, and this is true also for environmental information. Here you have the last Eurobarometer about the attitudes of European citizens toward the environment, and you see that the majority of the data show that the public is really very um, involve the environmental issues. So 58 of Europeans feel that protecting the environment is very important. 38% feel that more information about the environment could be given. And then here you have that uh, environmentally focused legislation or uh, funding for environment protection is supported by an enormous <coughs> majority of the public. <coughs> These last two slides are um, uh, thoughts from two researchers, social scientists Dan Kahan and Matthew Nisbet, about how environmental issues are perceived by the public. Dan Kahan has introduced this concept of cultural cognition, which refers to group values, like the attitudes of people regarding equality, authority, individualism, community, and how these attitudes influence risk perceptions and beliefs. 
So for example, he has made very interesting uh, experiments. He's very good in doing, in demonstrating his idea through experimental setups. Uh, in this one, for example, he grouped people according to whether they were more egalitarian or more individualistic. So he tried to group, make groups of these. And he showed to these people movies of experts talking about the popular, popular virus vaccine, which I think you know has been quite controversial. It wasn't clear where, whether it, it had to be applied or not. So people that were more close to corporate individualistic visions were in favor of applying it, while people that were more egalitarian, communitarian, were critical regarding this. The interesting thing is that he showed this video of expert, and this expert had mm, different attitudes. That is, there were experts that had uh, an aesthetics and a, and a discourse that was close to the individual, individualistic point of view, so a guy with a tie and uh, with a very uh, a set of, um, of uh, um, arguments uh, that were close to corpora, corporate rhetorics. And then other experts were saying exactly the same, but maybe with a ponytail and with uh, uh, I mean, they were supporting the same position, but with a different, with a different aesthetics and rhetorics. Mm -hmm. And what he found is that <coughs> this parameter was very important in the outcome of um, the positions of, the, of these groups. So, for example, when the guy in Thai was trying to convince the individualistic group that it wasn't so wise to apply the papilloma virus, he managed to convince more of them than the guy with the point here, okay? The, another very interesting experiment was done in nanotechnology. He, um, now he created mixed groups, groups in which more individualistic and more egalitarian people were discussing together about nanotechnology, and he measured the polarization of the group before and after providing scientific facts, okay? And what he found is that after providing these facts, the polarization increased, in, increased instead of reducing. So this was very striking because it meant that providing people with facts, with uncontroversial facts, does not necessarily reduce polarization regarding this issue. On the contrary, it may increase polarization. So the suggestion that he gives is basically and, and that I think you should take into account when you are communicating environmental issue is trying to present information in a way that reinforces people's values instead of threatening them and or and, uh, make the information uh, and communicate the information to a set of experts that I, is as diverse as possible in order to intercept the um, greater quantity of uh, uh, the greater spectrum of power. Matthew Lisbeth talks about framing, which is a very similar concept to cultural cognition. What he says is that politics is not about maximizing, maximizing rationality, that is the triumph of science and expert knowledge, let's say. Um, so he, okay, so it's a line of reasoning very similar to the one of uh, the previous one. And the advice he says is that what you need to do is for example, in the case of climate change, is not trying to sell climate change science or to improve science literacy. <laughs> it's really trying to partner scientists, science educators with um, stakeholders from the rest of the society and try to build a communication that is not one directional from expert to society, but it's bi-directional. Bi so experts, so-called experts, really need to learn from society as well. Okay, so I'm done about this first part. As I told you, I'm a, basically in science journalism. I usually cover hard science like genetics and these kind of things, uh, but there is relevant overlap, I think, with the kind of research you do. Uh, and 
The structure of the day will be the following. First of all, I will give you a talk about, to try to give you some context of uh, how um, science in newspapers really work, what is the uh, real cynical situation and not the blue sky uh, portrait of what's going on. Then, in the, after the coffee break, I will try to focus on some specific advice on how to write effective texts. Uh, and, uh, and then we will go to the exercise, which will be the larger part, the larger part of the day. So the exercise will be the first basic layer of thing that is interesting and is important to learn to do if you want to write about these kind of issues, that is trying to uh, extract from a paper. Uh, I think you have seen two papers, one on the Naples Waste Prizes and one on Jose Montana. Uh, try to extract from these papers a press release. So a press release would be addressed to journalists, basically to convince them to write correctly about your research, but mm, the, the, the criteria that we will, I will try to convey and that we will try to work on are useful to write whatever kind of news and they are the basis of also for writing, for example, a longer feature. So, first of all, before lunch, we do this writing exercise, divided in groups. Uh, I am the responsible of the fact that we will have lunch at the Spanish time at two, I'm sorry for that. Received subsequently, okay? And they found that, yes, papers that were reported on the New York Times, in fact, had a plus of citations with respect to papers that were not reported in the New York Times. Now, one could say, okay, this plus of citation is not explained by the fact that the paper has been reported in the New York Times. It may be that simply the New York Times chooses paper that anyway would receive a place of citation, okay? But they took advantage of a very curious situation, that is the fact that during a certain period, the New York Times uh, made a strike, the workers at the New York Times had a strike, they didn't publish the paper, but they continued to edit an internal newspaper only for the purpose of not interrupting the internal archive, okay? So the criteria for selecting articles were exactly the same, but those articles didn't come up to the public. And what uh, they saw is that in this case, this plus of citation disappeared. Mm -hmm. So really, it's a, it's a very striking study that shows you that what comes out in the media really influence a basic mechanism of scientific research, which is how scientists cite each other, okay? So in fact, there are, now there are interesting studies that when they calculate the impact factors of uh, scientific publications, they include also the impact factor of um, outlets like in the New York Times or The Guardian or, or this big thing. Okay, so after this introduction, uh, it uh, uh, starts to become clear that the standard traditional vision of how science, uh, health, environment, technologies communicated in the media, let's say the blue sky vision, is not um, uh, really, uh, not even close to what is really happening. What is this standard vision? It's a vision in which an exception has to be specifically um, allowed by the direction, and when this happens, uh, the information that the journalist has been invited to the conference mm -hmm. must be given to the reader, okay? So, likely, what we saw at the beginning, 2012, was the cons consequence of this story here. One thing I can say is that Micah Sanchez, this freelancer, got paid about 80 euros for that article, so if you pay 80 euros for an article, obviously, you cannot really expect to be top-level quality, and that she was allowed by somebody to go to the conference and it, uh, her article was uh, um, read and corrected by an editor. So, uh, and Paris gave all the fault to the freelancer, but there was a big bunch of responsibility uh, in the newspaper. So, I'm telling you this uh, uh, bad story, this sad story, because uh, the basic idea of this talk is to convey the fact that there are a lot of pressures when you write about science and environment as well in newspapers. There are a lot of biases and there are a lot of feedback loops that shape the picture of what comes out in the media when you write about these issues. And this is not a problem only of the media. This is a problem that, let's say, fires back to science itself. 
So for example, this is a very interesting study that was done in 1991, but I, uh, I'm sure it, works, it would work uh, today. In this study, basically, uh, the um, researchers asked themselves whether the fact that a paper was reported in the New York Times influenced the impact factor of the paper, okay? That is influenced, no, sorry, not the impact factor, influenced the number of citations that the paper obtained. Uh, uh, the title of the article was Pay as the Fifth Vital Sign. It was written by a freelance. And in this article, there was an, enthus an enthus enthusiastic description of another molecule, um, specifically uh, one called, okay, uh, it doesn't matter, uh, uh, another, another medicine. And um, uh, this medicine was uh, uh, described as a kind of um, wonder drug against pain and uh, it was uh, pro presented in a conference called the European Pain uh, Congress in uh, Lisboa. Mm. And uh, after this article was published, uh, there was an avalanche of uh, letters to El País, written by uh, doctors specifically, because they say, how can, can you present this as a wonder drug if trials have not been done, if there, are a lot, there is a big discussion whether this is effective or not. Or not. And the story ended with an article by Milagros Perez Oliva, which is a very important science journalist in Spain, and at that time was the person in charge basically of answering to complaints by readers. And she acknowledged that there was a big problem in this article. And the problem was that Micah Sanchez, the freelancer, had been invited by the company, Rumental in that case, to attend the conference. Uh, and she said, I will translate you, um, Well, she describes the, the fact that the, the article has been wrongly biased in favor of the, of the chemical, and she says that the uh, Libro de Estilo, which means basically the, the, the book that collects the rules uh, to which El País journalists have to uh, obey, let's say, establishes that the newspaper in general does not accept invitation to elaborate information <laughs> but uh, it was more practical like this, so take advantage of the coffee break. And then after lunch, we will um, basically put the exercise here, your work here on the wall, and, and discuss it together to try to figure out what are the best strategies. Okay, so first of all, let me start with an example taken from, taken from my specific uh, journalistic background, so basic science. This is an article taken from El País, the main newspaper in Spain. Um, it's in Spanish, but I will translate the main parts. So the title is uh, a, precision, uh, uh, a Bullet Against Cancer. And uh, it describes a molecule uh, that has been presented in a conference. The molecule is called Trastuzumab. Uh, it's a molecule against pain, <coughs> a new uh, uh, chemical against pain. And in the middle of the article, at a certain point, when Trastofumab is presented for the first time by the journalist, there is a parenthesis. And he says, this molecule is what the mm, pharmaceutical company Roche calls Herceptin. And he adds this sentence. Roche is the laboratory that has invited the país to go to the conference. What is he saying? He's informing the reader that he has been paid, that the journalist has been paid to attend the conference, okay? So this is kind of historical in the Spanish press. The article, I think it was in 2000, uh, no, sorry, it was in 2012, and I think it is the first instance in the Spanish press in which a journalist acknowledged that he has gone to a conference being paid by a company. So why this miracle? Why has this happened? Mm, because uh, a couple of years before, three years before, in 2009, there was another article on uh, mm, chemicals to cure 